not a specialist in climate, I can tell you that, uh, but I am a specialist in health and the brain, central, central nervous system. system. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how diet affects us and um, some data that is available, clinical trials with respect to different kinds of uh, diets and how they have to do with vascular health and brain health. And then once I talk about that, I'd like to talk about the effects of diet on environment health, um, our Earth's health. Uh, first, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what's happened to diet over the past uh, 40, 50 years. And as you can see, over on this side, it um, tells us where we were in 1970, and at the second point of each one is 2014. So between those uh, years, we have reduced actually the per capita consumption of beef. And this is looking at the United States. It says American, but they mean the United States. And then um, milk and eggs and that sort of thing has come down a little bit. But what has gone up instead is cooking oils, chicken, corn sweeteners, uh, like corn syrups and stuff like that, cheese, rice, and a little bit in um, uh, yogurt. And so this is another way of looking at it. So um, we see that things like eggs, fruit, if you look at uh, the first light yellow is again 1970 and the darker yellow, the gold is 2010. So we've stayed pretty much the same as far as vegetables, uh, beans, legumes, that sort of thing, fruit, eggs, that sort of thing. But what we've gone way up on is uh, foods that contain grains, fats, and oils. Uh, and we have not really changed our total meat intake. So we've converted a little bit from beef over to chicken but we, um, and pork, but we haven't really changed the total consumption of meat. And sugars we've gone up on, and this is what has caused the uh, diabetes and the obesity epidemic in the United States. So we've tried to make ourselves better, but we've also made ourselves tastier. And to do that, we've had to increase sugar and, and fats to do that. A lot of this is processed foods. And what I'm going to call here high, highly valued foods. That doesn't mean they have value in and of themselves. They have value at the checkout counter. So they're more expensive foods. So this is going out to the restaurant, fast food stores, and um, buying those things that I can just pop in the, the oven or the microwave. So there is a um, relationship between nutrition and brain function. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that. So why do we even care other than cosmetically we might not want to gain too much weight? There are some nutrients that are very specific and needed for normal brain function. Many of these nutrients are not available um, intrinsically. We can't just make it in our body. We have to consume it in order to get these specific nutrients. Of all the organs in the body, the brain has the highest metabolic rate and the greatest demand for specific nutrients that have to be consumed. In addition, because the brain is so important, the body can't function without a brain. And the brain is responsible for regulation of every component of bodily function. If you don't have a brain, actually there's a condition called brain death. And if your brain doesn't work, even if your heart is pumping, you are considered deceased. And that's because that part of your body will deteriorate because of the lack of brain control over the rest of your body. So because the brain is so important in that realm, it, it has this uh, protection system, which we call the blood-brain barrier. And what that is, is it is a system in which certain things can't get into the brain and certain things can't get out of the brain very easily. And so it's a protection against toxins. It's a protection against certain bacteria and certain chemicals, that sort of thing. And there are specific transport systems to get certain things into the brain and certain transport systems to get things out of the brain in order to maintain this, this protection system. So there are good things that need to come in, but they have to come in through certain transport systems. And there are certain things that the brain produces that needs to be removed. And it has to go through a transport system because we have a blood-brain barrier. I'm just gonna give you an example, which we'll go back to. And that is, um, this A beta lipoprotein. This is the amyloid stuff that we hear about with Alzheimer's disease. Amyloid is made naturally in our brain. It's a byproduct of cell 
synthesis, cell activity in the brain. And we have a specific transport system to bring it out of the brain and get rid of it. That is normal. We all have amyloid. And if you did an autopsy on every old person when they died, chances are you'll find amyloid deposits in their brain. That's a normal aging process. What happens, we think now with Alzheimer's disease is not this buildup of amyloid because it's natural. The problem is we can't get rid of it. And the reason why we can't get rid of it is a breakdown of this blood-brain barrier system that disallows the removal of amyloid from the brain. And if we lose the integrity of this blood-brain barrier, this vascular system for removal and entry of nutrients, then we don't get good nutrients in to, keep, to support our brain tissue and we can't get rid of the normal stuff that we need to process and get rid of. So keep that, that in mind. Okay. <clears throat> there are certain nutrients which are really very, very good for brain health. Up here we talk about, now this is looking at epidemiological studies, so this is human studies as well as animal studies. They show us that there is a neuroprotective effect with the consumption of vitamin E, the B vitamins, and then these N3 fatty acids. This is what you would find in cold water fish, um, avocados, that sort of thing. This is the, the healthy fish oil, is what we were talking about, but it's much better to eat the, the natural food. And there's a positive correlation, so we haven't really shown an absolute effect, but we see a positive correlation in studies between eating vegetables that are high in folate, vitamin E, and carotenoids, this is be primarily green leafy vegetables and seafood with these N3 fatty acids, primarily salmon, but cold water fish and berries, which have these polyphenols and uh, cognitive health. So we see a positive correlation. If you eat those kinds of things, you have better cognitive health. And then there's a probable neuroprotective effect with monounsaturated fats. Monounsaturated fats, um, the best one that I can think of would be this um, uh, uh, olive oil and some canola oil. It depends on how it's processed. <clears throat> Carotenoids, the berries again, and the vitamin D. Diets that are high in saturated fats, and a saturated fat is a fat that you could stick a fork in it and you can pick it up. So that's a cow. So if you put a, a, a fork in that fat that goes around your steak and you can pick up the whole steak by fat, it's a saturated fat. That means it's completely saturated, all the carbons on all the little areas that they can um, attach to. Whereas polyunsaturated, by and large, are mushier or more liquid types of fats. So anyways, um, if you have a diet that's high in saturated fats and a trans fat, the trans fat is any fat that you boil. So it's just a chemical term. So I can take the best fat in the world, like olive oil. If I boil it, that the bonds will fall apart. And when they re or reform on my fried chicken, they're going to come in the most comfortable conformation, which is the trans conformation. So that's what a trans fat is. And that's the fats that you will find in processed foods. What they call them is polyhydrogenated vegetable oils. It's a boiled fat. It's a fancy word for a boiled fat. And that has been associated with cognitive uh, problems and dementia. And the recommendations for a healthy diet then, what we do is we transform the studies we get looking at specific vitamins and specific fats, and we actually communicate it as far as how we talk to the public is in the form of food groups. And so that's what we're gonna pretty much talk about from now on. The effects of fat on the brain. <clears throat> fat composition that is high in saturated fat and trans fats and is low in those polyunsaturated fats which would be fats that you would find, say, in avocados and fish and that sort of thing, um, leads to blood-brain barrier dysfunction and then the formation of this A-beta lipoprotein in your brain. So trans fats cause an inflammatory response on the blood-brain barrier, which helps to break down the blood-brain barrier's function, which leads to buildup of entities within the brain which you don't understand completely how it works but that is shown in clinical trials to, well not clinical trials, in just studies to lead to higher incidence of cognitive uh, disorders and dementia. Long chain N3 fatty acids found in fish reduce this A-beta formation 
and oxidative damage. The oxidative damage is just the pro-inflammatory response I'm talking about. So the kind of fat you eat can either reduce the inflammatory response of this protective uh, layer access to your brain, and certain fats can cause the breakdown of that blood-brain barrier. Can I ask a question? Yes. Where would butter be in this? Butter? butter? Butter belongs to the cow, so it would be a saturated fat. Saturated. Yeah. And margarine just joins right along with you. It, it might have not be completely saturated, but it has got something. Did you say saturated is a good thing? Or no. It's a bad thing? Bad thing is saturated fats. Polyunsaturated fats, and yeah, the more um, like a fish oil, that sort of thing, those N3 polyunsaturated fats are the best. Saturated fats have been associated with dementias and break down the blood brain barrier, whereas the polyunsaturated fats that you would find in fish oils, olive oil, tend to have a protective effect with the blood brain barrier. While we're talking about it, before I forget, coconut oil belongs more on the saturated fat end than it does. So please don't believe Dr. Oz. He's crazy. Well, he's rich. That's what he is. He's rich. Okay, so cognitive health, recommended diet. There is this is one thing, and this is more what I'm going to talk about a little bit later with the environment, is there is no observed effect if you comply very highly with the um, healthy eating index that comes out of the USDA or the World Health Organization recommended diet. So what our governmental and international agencies has developed is a healthy diet is not necessarily one that has been proven, well it hasn't been proven at all, to promote health. Wow. And now we're going to talk about diets that do. Wow. Uh, what is a plant-based diet? Well. First of all, when we first started using plant-based diet, this was about two decades ago. And the reason why it was chosen at that is because vegetarianism at that time, and maybe not so much now, but certainly vegan, was considered to be a democratic or a liberal um, term. And so, um, as was exercise. And so, um, in order to get folks that didn't want to be liberal, uh, we started calling vegetarian diets and vegan diets plant-based diets. And then we started calling exercise physical activity. And that is a common term that you will hear in most doctor's offices now. We'll talk about plant-based diets and we'll talk about physical activity. And it's much better accepted by all groups that come into your office or that you meet on the street too. So a plant-based diet emphasizes fruit, vegetables, legumes, nuts, seed, oil, beans, and whole grain foods and does not necessarily eliminate animal products, but it will, it certainly should be the minimal part of a plant-based based diet. So the bulk of what you eat in a plant-based diet should come from a plant and not from an animal source. The first one I wanna talk about is the Mediterranean diet. There's been several studies looking at that. It's a wonderful diet and it's plant-based, and they do allow chicken, fish, eggs, cheese. This originated because people in Cyprus after World War II looked extremely healthy, and yet they had been starved. They had been cut off uh, by, I don't know who, one of you know, the armies was fighting. I think it was Germany had them all walled off so that there was nothing coming in or going out of there because they were worried of what they would do. I'm not really sure about the war part. But anyways, they were pretty much starving to death, but they were living off seafood and the fruits and vegetables on the land, they were all scrawny, they were underweight, and yet they were as healthy as horses when they looked at them afterwards. And it was because they were eating a ton of fruits and vegetables and they were eating fish. And so they started looking at, so we call it a Mediterranean diet, it's based on those initial studies and then taken from there. Uh, meals include small portions of meat. So this is a big difference from an American diet. By a small portion, a single portion of meat is actually a card, like a deck of cards or a little bit less is what's considered a, a single portion size. Water, sparkling water, other kinds of drinks that are natural are recommended. Um, no, none of the soda pops and the um, sugary uh, fruit drinks and, and things like that. And then um, you can add a small amount of wine or you could even transfer that over to a beer, but that has a J curve. And then for women, it's about four ounces. For men, it's about six to eight ounces of wine. At least doesn't do you harm. 
it may give you some good for vascular health, but it's a J. So you go home from work, you have that same glass of wine, then it's gonna have another one. What happens on the second one is it starts J up, increasing your risk, and that's what I mean by a J curve. So a little bit is either neutral or it helps, and more is um, deleterious to your health. Um, people on Mediterranean diets, well, what they try to avoid, and that would be the refined grains, such as white bread, pasta, pizza dough, that has white flour to it, refined oils, and it depends on how you make the canola oil. But canola oil, soy bean oils, maybe not so good for you. Olive oils, especially virgin olive, extra virgin olive oil, is probably the best that you can get. Uh, foods that have just plain sugars, the pastry, sodas, candies are not good. Deli meats, any kind of processed food, hot dogs, that sort of thing. Processed foods are not good, packaged foods. And it's because they're, they're made so that you want to buy more. And so if you're going to buy a packaged food, hanger, hamburger helper or something like that, look at, there's going to be polyhydrogenated vegetable oils in there, which are those saturated trans fats. And those are the worst kinds of fats, or they'll add extra sodium. This is just a food pyramid looking at it, and it's kind of interesting. I like the bottom part. The basis of the food pyramid is daily physical activity and enjoy your meals. It encourages people to eat in groups and have conversation. You tend not to eat too much when you're too busy telling everybody what happened to you today. A randomized controlled trials Mediterranean diet is associated with lower risk of heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, metabolic syndrome, uh, certain cancers, prostate, breast, and colon cancer, and overall mortality. Mediterranean diet is associated with better health and physical function in elders. It's been shown to delay um, cognitive decline in elders. And by elders, I mean people over the age of 50. Emphasizes a lot of fruits and greater than one fish per week. And then they, for some reason, threw in potatoes in there. This is a big trial, uh, the free diet trial, compared a low fat Mediterranean diet with the exception that they added extra virgin oil onto it, a little bit more oil into it, and nuts. And by adding it on, not overall over the years, but just more of a steady diet, so that they would have a green salad with a little bit of vinaigrette dressing on it, using extra virgin oil instead of some other oil you had, replacing the butter and putting olive oil on your, your toast in the morning, that kind of thing. So they made that kind of change. So not more oil, but it changes, switched to that oil. And what they found is that that had the greatest effect on sustained cognitive function throughout the lifespan. And then there's several epidemiological studies that have looked at this that have been able to confirm the benefit of a Mediterranean diet. The DASH diet is the second diet. This diet I find is a little bit harsher. Um, it is more vegetable oriented, but again, they do allow um, chicken and fish, but less than two servings daily, and their servings are quite small. It's more of a, well, my husband says, just a taste to make you think you're eating meat. Um, and they avoid salt, and there is an emphasis on that, but they do put an emphasis on grains, vegetables, fruits, nuts, and seeds. And what they found that this is the best diet for reducing your risk of um, heart disease, hypertension. Uh, it's good for diabetes, but it's the coronary artery disease diet. So if you've had a heart attack, they probably have told you about DASH diet. Now when we're talking about vegetarian diets, there's four groups that we look at as, as doctors. One is a flexitarian diet. And what that is, is that the person can eat eggs, dairy, occasional beef, poultry, and fish, and seafood, but it is a minimum part of their diet. So again, it's just like if you're gonna make uh, lasagna and you're gonna say, I'm gonna make meat lasagna. Well, in one serving of your lasagna, you might have uh, 1 20th of a chicken breast in there. You know, you'll have a few little pieces in there. Something like that to give a flavor of it, but it's not, Again, it's not the main portion of the food that you eat, but it can be, or you can have like certain days of the week that you're gonna have a meat dinner, and then other days you have primarily vegetable-based dinner. Pescatarian, of course, includes eggs, uh, dairy, fish, seafood, but no poultry and no beef. The vegetarian, if you're a lacto-octo-ovo vegetarian, then you have dairy and eggs, but no fish, seafood, poultry, or beef. And then the vegan, of course, no animal products, period. This is the next diet. The MIND diet is um, a combination of the Mediterranean and the DASH diet. 
um, but they um, emphasize 10 food groups that are really good for brain function. And that is beans, berries, fish, green leafy vegetables, nuts, poultry, olive oil. The poultry is just, that's not really necessary for the brain health. Um, olive oil, vegetables, whole grains, and a little bit of wine. Did you want something? Just a question I have Yes. Um, you talked about why fish is considered good and you know, there are other, other uh, vegetarian alternatives. Okay, uh, fish is good because it has an N3 uh, fatty acids in there which are good for brain health. Is that a big <laughs> And, um, Yes, avocados will have, there's lots of ways you can get it. But this, the pescatarian diet, this is uh, diets that are allowed based on uh, people's preferences. And eventually I'm gonna to wanna to take this to multiple cultures and how we can adapt a diet that we all can be happy with. So there's nothing wrong with vegetarian diet. The vegan diet has a little bit of problem with B12 and that just, you know, if you take a supplement, uh, that would be fine. But, there is a little bit of difficulty getting enough B12. Yeah. In the topic, just, when you say fish, what type? I mean, I'm talking about cold water fish. Cold water. Cold water salty fish. or sweet water. Just cold water. Well, like from all the I know. Sea or from lakes? All I know is from sea. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, would you consider uh, octopus a fish? Would you consider a uh, lobster fish? No. Okay. That's what I. Yeah. So and just galaxy shrimp are I don't consider a fish. Okay. Sea bass could be a fish. Yes, it is a wonderful fish. Yes. Yeah. Um, things with things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I I have a master's degree in zoology, but that was a bunch of years ago. <laughs> Okay, so what are we talking about? Okay, so anyways, the mind diet. The big thing with the mind diet is it emphasizes the consumption of dark berries. These are the antioxidant foods. Dark berries, blueberries, strawberries, blackberries, cherries, wonderful, and the green leafy vegetables. And really emphasize using those in your diet on a daily basis, but in particular, the biggest bang for your buck is the green leafy vegetables, to which I add for my patients that if you like to make soups or tomato based product thing, all you gotta do is throw it in that and the spinach, the kale, will taste just like the food that you're making if you hate the spinach and kale. And that's how I get folks to eat that sort of thing. Um, the unhealthy food groups, and which they really try to avoid, is butter and stick margarine, cheese, fast food, fried food, pastry sweets, and red meats. And so this diet really doesn't want you to eat beef at all, you know, maybe 4th of July. You know, nothing is absolute in these diets. We try to leave it open. Um, so that people can have their preferences and say things, you know, that are not good for you or big holidays where you can cheat. Thank you. So the guidelines is to eat at least three servings of whole grains a day. Try to eat salad a day. Eat one other vegetable on top of that. Maybe a glass of wine would be nice. If you're going to snack, try nuts. But please remember, a serving of nuts is 11 nuts. It's not a can. And it's not the salted nuts. It's, you know, the nuts. And then poultry and berries twice a week, one or the other. And then beans every every other day. Try to eat fish at least once a week, maybe more. Um, and then less than one serving of unhealthy foods, except for the butter. Absolutely no more than one tablespoon of butter a day. And if you could eliminate the butter, that would be a good idea. So the nutrients in, in the uh, mind diet, the green leafy vegetables are a source of folate, vitamin E, carotenoids, flavonoids. And this is definitely associated with lower risk of cognitive decline and dementia. And this has been shown in a myriad of trials, a bunch of them. Uh, vitamin E is associated as a neuroprotective agent, uh, found in these vegetable oils, uh, nuts, whole grains, as an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory effect. Uh, vitamin E, folate, flavonoids, and carotenoids are associated with inhibition of this beta amyloid, and vitamin E and flavonoids are associated with inhibition of a neurotoxic cell death, which is associated with dementia. And instead of a pyramid, they, uh, the best way to say is a mind bowl. And it's just a nice salad-based kind of, or 
green vegetable base dye. So you add things to make it tasty. But you always start with, how am I gonna get my grains, or my, my green leafy vegetables in me, and what grains am I gonna use to, to make it more flavorful? So in the MAP study, this is one of the ones back there, consuming one to two servings of green leafy vegetables a day is the same as being 11 years younger in age compared to those who didn't eat those vegetables every day. And fruits in general have not been shown to have this preventative cognitive decline. It's the berries. So when the studies emphasize berries, that's when we saw this um, avoiding the cognitive decline. So the evidence, there's this rush trial that was out there um, and they actually showed that the risk of Alzheimer's disease was reduced by 53%. And in those who were strictly adherent to the mind diet, those who were moderately adherent, there was a 35% uh, decreased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. But they looked at the age in which you got it as well as did you get it at all. So the people who got it either got it much later or didn't get it at all in the uh, uh, arm that uh, ate that diet. And the longer the participant adheres to the mind diet, better the benefit. So it is cumulative over years, but you can start at any age. And these trials start at people in their late 50s, early 60s. So at any age, we can start any, any diet. So to get started on it, <clears throat> eat more fruit, more fruit and vegetables at meals. It's best to try to add things before you subtract things out. So start adding fruit and vegetables at meals, and then gradually reducing the portion size and replacing the vegetables, don't starve yourself. So what you take away, you add back in with vegetables. And then try a meatless meal a week. We do meatless Mondays, and it's sort of religious thing. We're gonna do it every Monday, whether or not you know we want to. We're gonna figure out something that's meatless every Monday, and then you can build from there. Like meatless Tuesdays or meatless Wednesdays, whatever. Um, whole grains for breakfast, add berries to it. Increase uh, your variety of green leafy vegetables. And there's a variety of ways, and I'm not a cook, um, but you know you can boil, grill. I've eaten grilled uh, kale, and it's actually quite tasty with just a little bit of extra virgin oil on it. So now I'm going to switch on over to looking at the effects of the diet, the food we eat, and our environment. So this is showing you the greenhouse gas emissions. This is the equivalence of CO2 emissions per kilogram of meat that we consume, what has, what get, has to get added by growing these guys up, feeding them, processing them, and then we're eating them, what is the CO2 emissions in the environment, and what we find that the, the biggest contributor is the cow, um, followed by the product of the cow, the cheese, and then pork is less, chicken is less, eggs and milk. So the biggest defender of this is uh, beef. Without it there, I'm really a hard time. Oh, I think that was more just telling you, um, again, another illustration for what the contribution is to the environment. And actually, it, it is beef. Yes? I can speak to that. That's yeah. uh, essentially the, the biggest contributors to deforestation are beans, so like, particularly in tropical rainforests. And so, uh, soy, the majority of soy is used to produce uh, animal feed to grow the cows and the chickens. pork and chicken and soy, those are the big contributors to deforestation, which is one of the larger uh, uh, climate change drivers uh, in our situation. So the diet, <clears throat> the food that we eat does affect not only our personal lives, but also of our environment. A diet that is low in fruit and vegetables and nuts and high in red meat and processed foods is responsible for the greatest health burden worldwide in most regions of the world. Approximately two billion people worldwide are overweight or obese. Two billion people worldwide have nutritional deficiencies and approximately 800 million people worldwide suffer from hunger. And what I just learned yesterday, 3% of children who are obese are also malnourished. So obesity doesn't mean you're well nourished. A sustainable diet <clears throat> is defined as, as a diet that it will attain nutritional adequacy 
and reduce diet-related mortality, both by addressing dietary composition and the energy balance. So the nutrients that are in your diet, as well as the number of calories that you consume. They balance environmental impact between global and regional scales, and this includes both the technology management um, issues that are related with food distribution, processing and distribution. The challenge is to create a food system that supplies a healthy diet for a growing population of which our Earth is growing, uh, while reducing the environmental impact. I'm going to now present, um, this is a, I consider a landmark study. It's a modeling study, of which I'm not a modeler, and I don't really know much about it. I'm just taking it that they know what they're doing. And Lancet, in, as far as medical um, circles are, is the, the magazine, it's the most highly respected magazine that we have, journal that we have, that directs our care for our patients. And this is uh, Lancet Planet Health. And this came out in 2018. And it's um, health and nutritional aspects of sustained diet strategies and their association with environmental impacts, global modeling analysis with country level detail. And it was, um, looking at three different dietary approaches and its impact um, for a sustainable diet, sustainable for the human, and sustainable for the Earth's health, both health of both groups. The focus was on nutrition and reducing reduction of chronic non-communicable um, disease mortality and how the diets affect greenhouse gas emissions, cropland use, freshwater use, nitrogen application, and phosphorus application. So the design, they, it's a combined analysis of nutrients, diet-related, weight-related, chronic disease mortality, environmental impacts. They studied 150 countries, testing three sets of diet scenarios. They measured baseline food intake, in, intake and then they projected the food intake in 2050, what the demand will be. And they used um, this international model for policy analysis of agricultural commodities and trade to do that. And then they did nutrient analysis of the food. Um, they looked at nutrient adequacy of the diet, measured by calculating the uh, nutrient content in each food group, and its nutrient density as reported by the Global Expanded Nutrient Supply Database. In order to do that, they also had to look at, in each of these regions, each of these countries, what is the nutrients that would be absorbed from the soil, the water, that sort of thing. So it, it varies based on where you grow the stuff. And so they went right down to that level. Plus, they also looked at uh, water availability at certain aspects of the growing cycle and how that affects the nutrients within um, the, the plant product. And then the mortality analysis, they looked at nine risk factors for uh, uh, increasing death uh, that are related to uh, uh, food intake and then also uh, five disease endpoints that's related to the food that we consume. And so the uh, risk factors were high consumption of red meat, low consumption of fruit and vegetables, nuts, fish, legumes, underweight, obese, or overweight. And then the diseases were coronary artery disease, stroke, diabetes, site-specific cancer, which is that prostate, breast, and colon. Um, and, so, and then weight-associated death. And then the environmental analysis, they used a food systems model which connected the food consumption and production across these regions and paired the production estimates with country-specific environmental footprints uh, for the greenhouse gases. Now, they, the greenhouse gases they looked at were methane and nitrous oxide. They said they didn't look at CO2, uh, CO2 emissions because they said that belongs to the energy sector. And I don't have anything to say about that other than that's what they did. Um, and then fresh water use, that was both ground and surface water, nitrogen, and phosphorus as in fertilizer use. And then the model takes into account the trade, the feed, the processing, and then calibrates that based on the impact data, uh, modeling data. The three types of diet that they use, <clears throat> the first one was following environmental objectives by reducing the impact of animal source foods. So as we see that that which is related to the growth and production of beef is the biggest impact on an agricultural scale um, to the negative impact uh, to the environment. So they looked at just reducing um, animal source foods. If we just did that, what would be the, uh, and then they looked at this as a global impact. The second diet 
was looking at food security objectives, and that means to level off the energy imbalance. So some of us, uh, some countries are have an epidemic of obesity, and some countries have an epidemic of underweight. And so they're trying, going to try and level off each of those so that uh, some countries are eating too much, eat less, and those that um, not enough to eat more. But all they're looking at is calories, not food content, <laughs> calories. So I liken this to maybe when we're um, they're lifting stuff in uh, Darfur or something like that, where we're getting flour, rice, you know, we're not airlifting in fruit, but I a vegetable. And then the third is following public health objectives and encouraging nutritionally balanced dietary patterns based on the available evidence of healthy eating, which we just discussed. So here's the three. So the reduction in animal source foods, they modeled it for either a 25, 50, 75, or 100% reduction in animal source foods. That means 25% of it up to none. And then they would replace it, 75% legumes, 25% fruit and vegetables. And then the second objective is the calories. And then they would even off the calories by 25, 50, 75, or 100% um, normalization of the calories needed. Um, and simultaneous, either if you're underweight going up, if you're overweight going down for those countries. And then using the balanced diet, again, they use those four types of diet. There is the flexitarian, which um, stays away from processed foods and very small amounts of red meat, but moderate amounts of poultry, fish, and dairy, and generous portions of plants. Pescatarian, again, replacing the meat with two-thirds fish and seafood, one-third fruits and vegetables. The vegetarian replaced the meat with two-thirds legumes, one-third fruit and vegetables, and the vegan. All of it is replaced with two-thirds uh, legumes and one third of food vegetables. So the results, and the first one is where they just got rid of the cow, everything that came from the cow, uh, by 25, 50, 75, or 100%. And what they found is that the macronutrient content changed to lower protein and fat, especially saturated fat, which was good. The protein content remained adequate in high middle income countries, but it decreased below recommended amounts in low income countries. So these are countries that don't have a whole lot of beef to begin with, but they don't have a lot of vegetables and other things too. So eliminating or reducing the um, meat in low income countries was still curious to their health. Micronutrient intake, intake improved again in high and middle income countries because we're eating more plant-based sources. Um, and then in, um, in low income countries, that were already with a small amount of animal source foods that were replaced uh, with vegetables. There really wasn't enough replacement that could happen based on their agricultural practices and that sort of thing, that they um, showed increases in vitamin A, potassium, calcium, and B3 deficiencies. If you look at just change the calories, make the calories evened out. That one, the total energy reduced to achieve the recommended values in high and middle income countries, um, and increase to achieve recommendations in low income countries. So it improved the micronutrient intake in the low income countries, but vitamins still remain below recommended values because again, they're just eating a single food product, it's probably gonna be rice, something like that. Middle and high income countries did not uh, improve their baseline um, fiber and folate, potassium and iron is because all they're doing is reducing their calories, but they still are probably eating junk we're not eating good fruits because all we're emphasizing is reducing calories. And then, <clears throat> but it did reduce premature mortality somewhere between two and 10% with the lower end being the low income countries, the higher end being um, high income countries. And reduction in fruit and vegetables was associated with a 2% increased mortality. The nutritionally based diets, the nutrient values for vitamin A, iron, potassium, and fiber increased in all the diets that were, were tested. And vitamins uh, B3, calcium, B12 remained low with the vegetarian and vegan diets, but that could be supplemented. Um, the progressive reduction in mortality, somewhere between 4 and 12 percent, was found um, in conversion from animal based to plant based foods. So the more plant based you got, the further you got away from animals, your mortality improved and it improved more so in rich countries versus poor countries. It's going to be 
all the way through. There was a um, 50 to 58 percent reduction in mortality due to increased vegetable consumption, 29 to 31 percent reduction in mortality due to increased um, uh, fruit consumption, and a reduction in mortality was two to th three times greater in the higher and middle income countries due to the greater availability of plant-based food substitutes. So the biggest benefit, again, we're seeing in the middle and high income countries. Progressively replacing uh, the animal and plant-based food uh, leads to a reduction in the greenhouse gases by 20 to 84 percent. Fresh water use increased 4 to 16 percent because now you're producing more plants. Uh, Cropland use decreased 12 to 29 percent in the middle and high income countries. Mic nitrogen um, application reduced 22 to 39 percent. Phosphorus reduced 25 to 35 percent. Cropland use increased 1 to 15 percent in low and middle income countries because they're producing more plants. But let's remember that with them producing more plants, it improves upon their diet, which was poor to begin with. So they will increase their cropland use a small amount, but there is a tremendous decrease in cropland use in the high income countries because now there's less crops that have to be uh, grown for feeding the cows that will then feed us. Um, and the emissions go down up to 84% based on the amount of animal products that we don't consume. So what is a sustainably healthy diet then? Well, it takes more than just the diet. And there's a lot of things we have to look at and that's where it's grown, the transportation of it in, and then also the preferences within different cultures for different kinds of foods, that what kinds of foods would a culture uh, uh, adjust to. And one of the things that we find is that a lot of poor or low income countries model their um, ability of moving up um, with mirroring the, the diet of the high income countries, which is probably the worst thing they can do. And the one um, example I have that is when we were in Nicaragua, it was at a time where they were at war and there was an embargo, so there was nothing coming in and nothing going out. And so it was an extremely poor country. And uh, the women were shocked when I nursed my son after he was born because I didn't go out and buy the expensive powdered milk to make milk to give to him. And this is the emphasis, this is the, this is the culture that we set up, the example that we set up for lower income countries by how we model what is good for us. It sets an example for other income, you know, as people move up. So the highly valued foods are when we're finding that in Africa as the incomes go up, and they haven't gone up a whole lot, but as they go up, there is a greater demand for beef and for processed foods. People are urbanizing and demanding more of those kinds of foods in those countries. So we have an excellent opportunity, I think, right now, that if we change our culture here and have some sort of a leadership role, that we can actually set a stage for um, what is a valued food because the value of food is what we eat, period. So in summary, sustainable diets can result in improving both environmental and health impacts globally. The health impact is greatest in high and middle income countries, but there's a positive impact possible in low income countries when a sustainable diet can be improved with a more diversified diet. Global public health emphasis on dietary change to plant-based diet and improving energy balance is a suitable approach to a sustainable diet. And updating our national and international dietary guidelines that reflect the evidence of what makes up a healthy diet may help the political entities as well as developmental organizations set goals and implement strategies to help climate change. And then a few things that I think in conclusion, like takeaway things that we might consider doing, is public education, discussion, and action within our community or outside our community also, that concerns the link between rural human systems, nutrition, health, and the climate. I don't think we ever think about that what we eat really affects world health, the Earth's health, as well as our health. And the food production and consumption affects the Earth's health as well as human health. Human diet choices that can improve both human health and Earth health, what might they be? 
and then the role of improvement of cropland productivity and reduction of waste in the Earth's health. This is something I didn't talk about because I'm not an expert in this. But measures to successfully reduce greenhouse gases has to include improved productivity, especially in the lower income countries, so that they can better use their, their resources. And also closing up and reducing food waste because there's a huge amount of greenhouse gases that come from low productivity and, and um, increased waste of, of food. And then also closing that inequality gap of healthy food distribution with an em emphasis on reducing animal source foods. So I think within our own community, we do have areas where there is not really a ready availability of fruits and vegetables that are affordable. And then take it from there. So that's all I got to say. Be happy to answer any questions. We need we got it behind and we need to get back on to, on time. Yeah. Uh, I just wonder where I mean you mentioned fruits but then you say berries, so where do like apples and pears fit they in? Don't this? Fit in. See the the antioxidant foods are those dark berries and they really help the brain. But all fruits and vegetables are high fiber. Fiber is fantastic. And I'm not talking about Metamucil, I'm talking about fiber in a food. Everybody wants to get stuff out of a pill, but it, it really the natural product is a way to do that. What fiber will do, well number one, it's great for colon health, but number two, if you do have a diet that has some saturated fat in it, what fiber will do is if you eat it at the same time, is it sequesters that saturated fat and it's removed in the natural way rather than being absorbed into your body. So increasing the diet, with fiber will help reduce your cholesterol level to begin with and it allows you to cheat. And that's my Thanksgiving remedy for my husband. He has to have four high fiber vegetables before he gets any pie. <laughs> <laughs>